Welcome to True Gay Crime, a podcast about queer crimes and criminals. I'm your host, Patrick Moreno. Supporting True Gay Crime is super easy. On YouTube, you can like it, you can share it, you can subscribe to the channel. You can find the link to my Patreon in the description on YouTube and in the show notes of this episode, or you can show your support by subscribing to this podcast. That link is also in the show notes of this episode. A quick reminder to rate and review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, and if you know a fellow true crime lover, why not tell a friend about true gay crime? And as always, the sources for this episode can also be found in the show notes or in the description on YouTube. This is a disturbing tale of how an unassuming man lived a double life. Leaving a trail of death along the highways of Southern California, he shares the dubious title of The Freeway Killer with two other serial killers that we've covered already, William Bonin and Randy Kraft. This is the story of one of California's most elusive and least known serial killers, Patrick Kearney. True Gay Crime contains coarse language, adult themes, and content that is violent and disturbing. If at any time you feel you need help, please refer to the toll-free crisis lines in the show notes. Patrick Wayne Kearney is born on September 24th, 1939 in East Los Angeles, California. He's the oldest of three sons. He comes from a relatively quiet and average middle-class family by all accounts, but from a young age, Patrick is a small lad. He's sickly, he's shy, and he's introverted. These traits, of course, make him easy target for bullies throughout his childhood who beat him up and call him queer. The bullying is something that deeply scars him and shapes him into who he will eventually become. Psychologists often say that bullying fosters a sense of powerlessness in its victims, leading them to develop violent fantasies as a way to regain control. For Kearney, this would turn out to be tragically true. By his teens, he's already fantasizing about murder. Kearney's family doesn't notice anything terribly off about him, although in his teens, he does harbor fantasies about killing his enemies and skinning them alive. He keeps that to himself, of course, and starts to develop sexual fantasies about domination over others and even dabbles in bestiality. After graduating high school, he goes on to join the U.S. Air Force. He seems like a young man with promise, but behind the mask of normalcy, a darkness is simmering. It's his personal relationships that are worth noting from here on in. Kearney is gay, and for much of his adult life, he lives with his partner, David Hill. Their relationship often seems relatively stable, but there are underlying tensions, tensions that would soon spill over into violence. Now, a little bit about David Hill. He's a high school dropout from Lubbock, Texas, who joins the Army in 1960, but he's soon discharged on diagnosis of an unspecified personality disorder. After the army, he marries his high school sweetheart, but the marriage does not last. Then in 1962, Hill meets Kearney while they're both in Texas, and together they move to California. They live in Culver City, which is a suburb of L.A., when a string of mysterious murders begins. You see, it's during this time... In his early years in Southern California that Kearney learns how to pick up hitchhikers and stray men found wandering alone. The stresses of living together mean Hill and Kearney start to argue more often and Kearney often goes out alone for long drives in his Volkswagen Beetle or in his truck. He develops an M.O. and it remains constant for the entirety of his nightmarish murder spree. He picks up young male hitchhikers, runaways, and young men from gay bars and along the California freeways. He chooses victims that won't be missed right away. Many come from marginalized communities, young men whose disappearances often go unnoticed. 
being a small man, he's unable to physically overpower his victims, so he decides to use a Derringer .22 pistol to kill them quickly before they have time to react, strike back, or escape. It's a cold, quick, execution-style killing. With his left hand on the steering wheel, his right hand shoots his victims over the ear, all while watching the speed limit so to not arouse suspicion. He's not a sadistic killer, and his intention is never to inflict pain, unlike the other two freeway killers. He does, however, mutilate and dismember bodies, but only post-mortem. He drives with the corpse slumped over in the passenger seat until he reaches his destination where, being a necrophile, he sodomizes the body. Then, in order to better dispose of his victims, he dismembers the remains with a hacksaw and scatters them in different locations like canyons and landfills along the freeways, often in industrial trash bags. This is where Kearney will earn his infamous moniker, the Freeway Killer. The bodies are scattered across various freeways, a macabre calling card that eventually catches the attention of the media and law enforcement. And yet Kearney manages to evade capture. His ability to blend into society and appear completely normal is his greatest asset. In some cases, the remains are left to the animals in the desert to consume, or the blood is drained to avoid odors, or the body is washed to eliminate evidence such as fingerprints. Then in an act of catharsis, which he envisions his victims to be the bullies of his childhood, he beats his victims after they're dead to vent his suppressed anger, more so when the victim resembles a bully from his past. Because of his stealth movements and the ability to fly under the radar, there are conflicting reports as to when the murders begin and who they were. Some bodies are unidentified and some are never found. But sources say that in the spring of 1962, he commits his first murder, a young white male, 19 years of age. Kearney convinces the young man to go for a ride on his motorcycle to a secluded spot outside Indio, California. When they get to the designated spot, and Kearney feels they're far enough away from prying ears and eyes, he shoots his victim and molests the corpse. Sadly, his second victim is the cousin of the first, who had seen the two ride off on the motorcycle and also wanted to go for a ride. Another source says that the first murder actually happens around Christmas 1968 while living in Culver City with his partner, David Hill. The victim, known only as George, is lured into Kearney's vehicle and driven from San Diego to his home in Culver City. As soon as George steps into the residence, he receives a shot to the back of the head. Kearney drags him to the bathroom, sodomizes him, places him in a bathtub, and skins and dismembers him with an exacto knife. He even removes the bullet from the head so that it can't be traced to him. He then takes the body and buries it in the backyard behind the garage. Afraid of being caught out by the police, Kearney doesn't kill for another full year. But a pattern emerges, and there are bodies being found in the early 70s, but law enforcement struggles to connect the dots because there are so few similarities between the victims. They range from hitchhikers to runaways to young gay men. At his peak, Kearney's murder spree goes undetected. A local grocery store owner named Jerry Stevens remembers Kearney coming in and buying butcher knives more frequently than he thought was normal, but hindsight is twenty twenty. Stephen reflects on how Kearney was always alone and eerily quiet. His supervisor at work describes him as a model worker. By 1975, police are investigating a string of murders that stretch back years. Detectives are stumped and forensic science is in its infancy and serial killers like Kearney are not yet well understood. What little DNA evidence is available can't help much at the time, and witnesses are scarce, and Kearney's quiet demeanor keeps him under the radar. He's very strategic. His victims, often people living on the fringes of society, many with no families or stable homes, this makes it harder for police to track any consistent pattern. Even though Kearney has a distinct M.O., picking up hitchhikers, quickly killing them with a gunshot, and dismembering their bodies before scattering the remains, Kearney continues his spree unabated for years. 
It's unclear how many close calls he had with law enforcement, but at one point, police begin to suspect him after several bodies are found near his residence. Still, they lack enough evidence to make an arrest. The trash bag case is officially launched April 13th, 1975, when 21-year-old Albert Rivera's mutilated remains are found near San Juan Capistrano. In the next six months, six more bodies are found in L.A., Orange, Riverside, and San Diego counties. March 1977, two more bodies are found, bringing the body count to eight, and a very distinct pattern is obvious. Each victim is discovered to be homosexual, they're found nude, shot in the head, some are dismembered or mutilated with their remains tied up in plastic garbage bags. His victims are primarily young men, but there are known child and adolescent victims as well. The youngest, Ronald Smith, is only five when he goes missing in Lenox, California in August of 1974. 13-year-old Michael McGee is picked up by Kearney in June 1976 while hitchhiking to Torrance. His remains are never found. An eight-year-old Merrill Chance vanishes in April 1977 while riding his bike nearby Kearney's workplace, and he's found in the Angeles National Forest the next month. He will be Kearney's last known victim. But the victim who ultimately leads to his arrest is 17-year-old John LeMay, who is killed in March of 1977. At approximately 5.30 p.m. that same day, John tells his neighbor that he's going to Redondo Beach to meet a man named Dave. Dave, as it turns out, is David Hill, and David Hill had met John at a local gym. But when John shows up at his house to meet David Hill, David is not there. Kearney is. And while John sits watching TV and waiting for Hill, Kearney grabs his pistol and shoots John in the back of the head, completely unprovoked, he then dismembers the body. Five days later, police find his remains beside a highway south of Corona. And since John had told people where he was headed the day he was killed, a warrant is issued for David Hill and his partner, Patrick Kearney. Police question the men in the home and they cooperate. However, as soon as the cops leave, the pair go on the run. Kearney resigns from his job, and the men flee to El Paso, Texas. But in Texas, it's actually their families that persuade the pair to turn themselves in. So, on July 1st, they waltz into the Riverside County Sheriff's Office, point to the wanted posters on the wall, and announce, That's us. Now, it seems the police have the culprits of the trash bag murders in custody, and on July 5th, 1977, they make public that they have confessions from the two male suspects thought to be responsible for 15 victims in five counties. Patrick Kearney and David Hill are charged in only two cases, but Kearney leads detectives to six alleged dumping sites on the California-Mexico border, and by week's end, police have recovered 12 bodies. Damning evidence is also recovered from the home that includes fibers that match those on several corpses and a bloodied hacksaw. Shockingly, David Hill is cleared of any involvement in Kearney's crimes and is released from custody after Kearney shoulders all the blame, telling the police that he killed because, quote, it excited him and gave him a feeling of dominance. For Kearney, there is no escape. He confesses to all of the crimes, and by July 15th, he signs a confession of having murdered a total of 28 victims. During the confession, he speaks matter-of-factly with no signs of remorse, no apologies, nada. Desperate to avoid the death penalty, the serial killer agrees to plead guilty in court and is officially charged with 21 counts of murder and receives 21 life sentences. However, without sufficient physical evidence to prove otherwise, police cannot charge him for the other seven murders. Kearney could be responsible for over 30 murders that will probably never be solved, making this case one of the largest mass murder cases in American history. 
says Lieutenant Edwards Douglas of the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, I don't know if we'll ever know the total because some bodies may be beyond recovery. As of 2022, Kearney is incarcerated at California's Mule Creek State Prison. Patrick Kearney's crimes leave a deep scar on Southern California, particularly within the gay community. Many of its victims are young gay men, a fact that leads to significant fear and mistrust in an already marginalized group. At the time when the gay community is fighting for equality, Kearney's actions cast a shadow. Though Kearney's crimes may not be as widely known as those of other notorious killers like Jeffrey Dahmer, his calculated, cold-blooded approach sets him apart. He wasn't driven by passion or jealousy or revenge. His motives seem simpler. Control, power, and a desire to remain unseen. Kearney's case also raises important questions about the vulnerabilities of marginalized communities, something that we've talked about many times on this podcast. Many of his victims were young men who lived on the edges of society, people who were often ignored or overlooked. Their deaths didn't make headlines right away, and many of their families didn't have the resources to demand answers. Patrick Kearney, the freeway killer, may never have become a household name, but his calculated killings leave behind a legacy of fear and unanswered questions. What drove him to commit these murders, and how many more victims are there out there whose names we may never know? If there's anything to take away from this story, it's that evil can lurk behind even the most unassuming faces. Kearney lived a quiet life, holding down a stable job, living with his partner, and keeping to himself. And yet, beneath that calm exterior was a man capable of unimaginable horrors. So, here are my final thoughts, and something for us to discuss. It's interesting to me that somebody who has such a large body count is kind of de de brought down a few pegs in, in his sort of famousness because there are so many other killers that are so much more prolific. <laughs> I mean, like, I did he not cause enough damage that he shouldn't be more known, Patrick Kearney? I mean, not that we need to hold up these people and make them famous, but just you think that you may have heard about this person before because his body count is so high is what I'm saying. Um, another interesting thing, and I say this in my outro, and you'll hear it at the end of this episode, if you listen all the way to the end, where I say, you know, tell someone where you're going, because that makes all the difference. The reason he was caught was because John LeMay told his neighbor that he was going to Redondo Beach to meet a man named David Hill. So when you're going somewhere... Tell somebody where you're going. You might not survive the night, but the perpetrator has a chance of getting caught now because people know where you were, especially in this age of like apps and anonymous hookups and all of this stuff. I mean, it's just so dangerous. Tell somebody where you're going. There were a couple of, uh, in, in some of the research that I did, there was some um, discussions between professors of psychiatry and stuff back in the days. So this is like at the end of the 70s, so very different time. Um, but the discussions that they were having back then are uh, obviously the, the discussions have changed immensely from then. But I just wanted to read you a little bit. It's not funny because it just seems it, it's funny in the sense that I can't believe they actually thought this way. But it's not funny. Ha ha. It's just funny. Weird. Um, for example, Robert Gould, who's a professor of psychiatry at New York Medical College, he estimated that the number of murders committed by homosexuals is probably no greater, but more proportional than those committed by heterosexuals because there was this debate like are homosexuals more dangerous than heterosexuals like that was actually something that they were discussing <laughs> and debating um he adds quote when it's a homosexual who kills 10 people or 12 or whatever the headline is homosexual kills and something like that sticks in your mind he goes on to say that you never get a headline that says heterosexual kills and so that is something that they were dealing with at the time, pointing out that, you know, it, this is a homosexual man that murdered. The, yes, he was gay, but that's to put that in the headline. It makes it seem like all gays are killers. 
Um, so that was his point. And then it says, the questions raised by the case about the problems of homosexual relationships sharply divide psychiatrists as well as psychologists. So the question was, are homosexuals any more given to aggression than the rest of the population? Most people were saying no. I mean, rightly so, saying no. But some experts thought that they, homosexuals were more prone to pathologies. Um, so psychiatrist Gould says, quote, I think you will find more <laughs> disturbed homosexuals. The extra fill-up of pathology in the homosexual is due to, get this, cultural opposition and discrimination. So, I mean, at least he's saying the discrimination against homosexuals is what's making them more pathological, I guess. But this is funny. Others believe that a male homosexual sex relationship has more potential for aggression simply because both partners are male. The blend of sex and male-to-male -male rivalry can be explosive. I mean, that's obviously just a load of crap. Uh, on one point, most observers are agreed homosexuals are more vulnerable to physical attack because accepting sexual invitations from total strangers is an established part of the gay scene. And that is true. We know that that is happening. And that's why it's important. Just tell somebody where you're going. Just text them a name, an address. I mean, it could make the difference. Um, psychologists... So Berkeley psychologist Michael Evans had said, quote, homosexuals are an easy population to get access to in some anonymous ways. And Chicago Police Sergeant Richard Sandberg says, quote, the gays are easy prey. So, I mean, not wrong. How many stories, you know, marginalized communities, people on the fringes, people that predators know can go missing and won't be missed so much. Also, if you're listening on YouTube, let me know in the comments what you think about David Hill getting off scot-free. Do you think Patrick Kearney's partner, David Hill, had anything to do with any of the murders? Did he know about them? Did he turn a blind eye? Let me know in the comments. Otherwise, thank you for listening, and I will see you in the next episode of True Gay Crime. Did you know you can subscribe, rate, and review True Gay Crime on Apple Podcasts? It would mean everything to me if you did, because it helps me create content you like, and it lets Apple know to share it with more people. Thank you for listening. And remember, always look behind you, lock your doors, tell someone where you're going, and look out for each other. Why can't we all just get along? <laughs>